Well, good morning, church. It is great to be back here with you this Sunday morning. If you're a guest with us this morning, welcome. We are super excited that you're joining us today. My name is Rich. I have the privilege to serve here as a campus pastor with some amazing people. Uh, we are stoked that you're hanging out with us today. We hope that you enjoy your time with us. If we, as we get going this morning, if you just open your Bibles or your Bible apps, whatever you use, to John chapter 17, John chapter 17, and in a few moments we're going to be starting at verse 10, John 17 verse 10. If you grab the Bible on the way in, you will find it on page 739, 739, John 17 page 739. This morning we're stepping into a series uh, that as we walk through it, it will probably rub rub some of us in this room uh, the wrong way. We will, might be a little upset, we might be a little irritated, you know. um, You really can't talk about church and politics without offending someone, right? I mean, it's just going to happen. You're gonna, I'm going to say something like, oh, no, you didn't. And, and you're going to walk out, and I hope you don't. But uh, you may. And so you're going to offend someone because you think about it. I mean, it makes sense. We all have our personal views. We have our personal opinions. We have our political parties, our platforms, our candidates. And, and so we have them. And we think or we've come to believe that we're right in our position, I mean, because if we weren't right, why would we hold to them? It just wouldn't make sense, right? You'd be like, oh, I don't know what I believe, you know. So it, it, we hold to them. And so when we're challenged, when we're challenged in our views, we're challenged in our positions, when we're challenged in what we believe to be true, it kind of becomes an irritant in our lives. We're like, ah, I don't know if I like what's being said. I don't know if I agree with being said. I don't know. And so what normally happens when we get challenged, we shut down. We put up the hand and say, talk to the hands because the ears are not listening. We, we shut down, we ignore it, we, or we want to argue about it, we want to debate about it. You know? And so we're going to be walking through some things that might just challenge us um, to think differently, to maybe even live a little differently. Um, and if I'm being honest, when it comes to politics, I don't give politics a lot of headspace in my life. I really don't. And people have shared with me, Rich, that is a weakness for you, that is a blind spot for your life. And, you know, they tell me these kind of things. You're missing out on some serious things that are taking place. And I've been told all those things before, but I don't give it a lot of headspace in my life because I've seen what politics can do. I've seen what politics would do to a family. I've seen what politics can do to friendships. Where, where people get together and they start arguing, debating about things. They're, they're sitting on different sides of the same fence and they keep on going at it. Where, where the Christmas gatherings, Thanksgiving gatherings, and family reunions turn into like mini silver wars because someone wants to talk and debate politics. Has anybody ever been in one of those situations? Like, come on, show me that I'm not alone. You've seen it happen. Maybe you're a part of the problem and you don't want to raise your hand, you know. Um, so maybe, you know, you've been there and you see what I'm talking about. You know, growing up, there was that phrase that we heard in polite company, we don't talk about politics and religion. And the reason being is because when we start talking about politics and religion, people stop being polite, Right? <laughs> So guess what we're going to talk about for the next three weeks? We're going to have some fun with this. And if you walked in, I don't know if you noticed in the front sign or the side sign here, I had them purposely put in, in there to tell the people it's politics versus religion. Politics versus religion or religion versus politics, whatever you want to say, because it's exactly how many in our nation see it. We see opposing forces. And unfortunately, that's how many people who are in the church see it. It's politics versus religion. You know, there's a growing group inside the church who have come to believe that politics can make a bigger difference than Jesus. Now, now we would never say that out loud. I mean, I mean, come on, right? I mean, that just sounds ridiculous. Rich, I can't believe you uttered those words. But let's step back and just kind of look at some of our, look at our lives, look at some of the things that are taking place. I mean, how are we talking to people who think differently than us when it comes to politics and their position? 
How are we engaging conversations? What are we, when are we talking about people? When we're talking to people, what are we actually talking about? Are we talking about Jesus and how he changes everything? Or are we talking about our candidate and what our governor's doing? And I, I mean, what are we actually talking about? In our social media, what are we posting about? What are we sharing? Right? What are we saying? Amen, brother. Amen, sister, too. There's a lot of political garbage and things are being shared right now. So if you actually step back and look at the broad spectrum of our lives, it might actually show us that we're actually leaning to believe that politics can make a bigger difference than Jesus. Instead of letting our faith fuel our political view We have unknowingly created a faith that's built on our political view. And that is radically different. When it comes to politics and religion, and as we walk through this series, I want to challenge us to see some things differently. I want to challenge us all to think a little differently. And, And if you would be honest with me, and we'll stop and walk through this series together, I think we can start living a little differently. And how we live is a great impact for the kingdom. This morning, we're looking at John chapter 17. Uh, We're going to be stepping into kind of like the heart of Jesus and his church. John chapter 17, I consider this the Lord's Prayer. Because Jesus is our Lord, and he just spends a really good amount of time praying. Uh, You can say this is the high priestly prayer. Like Hebrews calls Jesus the high priest over his church. And Jesus is getting on his knees, and he is praying. But if we just step back and look at John 17, there's there's a long conversation taking place. It actually starts back in John chapter 13. And Jesus is in the upper room with his motley crew, his disciples, right? His, the, his boys, the people he's doing ministry with, and he's hanging out with them. And it was just before he was arrested, just before he was crucified. And he's walking through with the people that he's closest to, demonstrating his love and humility for others by getting down and washing their feet, He's showing them there's a com- that he'll comfort them that when, when, they, when he leaves and he's going to send the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to reside with you. You're not going to be alone and you're going to do greater things than me. And he says that, that he has his followers. We can do nothing apart from Jesus. That he is the vine and we are the branches. And the branches that are connected to the vine of life starts producing fruit in life. So Jesus is leading them. He is talking to them. He is instituting communion, which we're going to be doing next week. He's just going all out with these guys. And all of a sudden, he just stops. In the middle of his conversation, he just stops. And he looks up to heaven, and he starts to pray. He looks up, and he says, Father, the, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. In the middle of everything he's teaching and leading and all this stuff is going on, he just stops and prays. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd like to think what these guys were thinking. I mean, they're leaning in in Jesus and he's going along and all of a sudden he just stops and prays. I mean, wait, wait, what? Okay, we're praying right now. Do we close our hands? We take our head out? Do we get on our knees? I mean, Jesus just totally caught us off guard. We're praying. Have you ever been in those situations when someone, you're getting ready to pray and all of a sudden they just start praying? No? Is anybody? Where you say, hey, okay, let's pray. And all of a sudden, before your even head gets down, someone's saying, in Jesus' name, amen. You're like, wait, my heart wasn't right. I wasn't, my mentally wasn't prepared. I was thinking about the barbecue ribs that are on the thing. You know, you, know, you, you get your, you weren't even ready. And all of a sudden, someone says, amen. So I can only imagine what his disciples were thinking when in the middle of his teaching and leading them and walking through the last moments with them before he was arrested and crucified, how he just stopped and prayed. Now, I don't think it was by mistake. I don't think it was by mistake that Jesus started talking to the Father in front of his future of his church. 
I don't think it was by mistake. I feel as if he wanted them to lean in and listen to the intimacy and the honesty of the hope that Jesus wanted for his church. He wanted expressed in his church. I don't think it was by accident that John, who was an eyewitness to all this, wrote this, these words down that have been preserved by God for almost 2,000 years. That you and I are reading them and studying them and learning from them today. I don't think it was by accident. And so as we step in and talk about the heart of Jesus and the heart of his church and look at this topic about politics and religion, Jesus actually gets really personal. And I think he makes it really clear what he desires from you and I and what he desires for his church and how we're to be different. Look at verse 10 with me as we kick this off. It says, all I have is yours. He's talking to God. All you, all you have is mine. And the glory that has come to me through them, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. He's talking about his disciples. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. There's power in Jesus' name. The name that you gave me. Why? So that they may be one as we are one. So they may be one as we are one. One. We're having a conversation about politics and religion. One of the things we need to understand as a church, as a church, we are first unified under Jesus. We are first unified under Jesus. Jesus is talking to the Father, knowing that he was leaving, knowing that his death would bring chaos and fear, knowing that that the hope of the first century church would be kind of confused. They might feel a little lost because they're standing back and still trying to figure out all this thing, Jesus, in front of them. They're trying to understand it all. And he says to the Father, unify them. Make them one as we are one. Father, there's going to be a lot of opinions. There's going to be a lot of confusion. There's going to be a lot of doubt when things go down. There's going to be a lot of frustration while people are waiting. There's going to be a lot of things going on. Father, they could easily fall on two sides of the same fence and start to divide. Father, I am praying that you bring them to be one as you and I are one. Friends, politics, nothing divides like politics. Politics are a superhighway created to divide what Jesus prayed to be unified. Created to divide what Jesus prayed to be unified. And if we are looking honestly in the church, our church, the big church, the whole Jesus church, there are are Republicans in his church. There are Democrats in his church, Libertarians in his church. There are people in every political party that may be now or may come later that love Jesus. Now I can see all the thought bubbles are popping up above your head. Like, Rich, are you, are you for sure about that? I mean, seriously, have you looked into? Are you, I mean, come on, I, what about? And you're thinking of ideas. You've got these mental arguments already going in your head. Like, you've got to be off your rocker to say things like that. We are unified first under Jesus. And if you read these verses, John chapter 17, 10 and 11, and if you're anything like me, I try to find loopholes in everything. There's got to be a way out. There's got to be a different view. There's got to be some ways that I don't have to obey or pay attention. I've been doing it all my life, and I'm pretty good at it. Just ask my wife. But there's no out. Because you can say, well, Rich, he's talking to his disciples. He's in, he, he's in the upper room, right? He is talking directly to them. Because that's where my mind goes. Like, <laughs> he's not talking to me. Well, let's drop down and look at verse 20. 
Verse 20 says, Father, my prayer is not for them alone. It's not for the the disciples alone. My prayer is for those who will believe in me through their message. Who will believe in me through their message. And what is their message? It's the gospel. The message of hope that Jesus changes everything. Father, I am praying for everyone who will ever believe. Every little child who comes to understanding that they need a savior, right, in a backyard Bible camp. Every teen who comes to youth ministry or growing and understanding for the heaven, a personal relationship of Jesus, how he changes everything. Every adult who's walked through life, who's had a hardship, addiction, abuse, loneliness, what everyone, everyone who ever comes to that point and says, I need Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. He is praying for them. No one in the church is excluded. And what does he pray? Verse 22. That they may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I'm in you, that we would be one, unified under Jesus. And if you're in this room this morning... And you've said yes to Jesus. He's talking to you. And right now, because everything going on with COVID, we are politically divided. We are nationally divided. Even in the church, we are divided. And as November comes, we are perfectly set up to be divided all the more by what's coming in front of us. Now, I'm not a prophet. I'm not going to say I have prophecy. I've seen things. I say things. I'm not saying that at all. But our nation, there's a great potential for a national eruption to take place in November. Right now, fueling the tension, the politicians, the politics, people. It's growing. And no matter who wins the election, people are going to be angry. And some are, will be celebrating on the tears of others. Tell me you can't see it. Tell me that you're not reading the news feed and you can't see it coming. Jesus saw it coming. Jesus saw this coming and so much more that he've already been through and so much more that it's coming. He saw it coming and he called out to the Father. He said, Father, let my followers, my church, be one, unified under me and my purposes. Unity comes from a purpose greater than ourselves. And in Jesus, we have one purpose. But for some reason, we love to attach ourselves to organizations. We love to attach ourselves to to other groups, political parties, their positions, or candidates. We love to attach ourselves to all these things. We put bumper stickers on our cards. On our cars, we have we have those yard signs in the middle of the front lawns. We we do all these things. We post up stuff on social media. We tie ourselves to the all these things. to the political views, to our positions that we believe are right, to the candidates, and we continue to divide what Jesus prayed to be unified. Let me just share with you this morning, as soon as you connect yourself to their message, you have connected yourself to their movement. As soon as you connected yourself to the message, you have connected yourselves to their movement. Do some research. Understand what you're pointing out there. Understand what you're arguing about. There's a lot of organizations out there that that are just bad. 
And as soon as you start tagging things and putting things out there, like, this is what I believe, you tie yourself to the movement. People are looking at you and thinking, you are all that. You're all of what they believe. You're all of what they're looking for. You're all what they're looking to get accomplished. That's what people see when we, we pull ourselves and align ourselves and promote ourselves with a position, of, uh, an organization, or a candidate. And I don't know about you. There is no political party, there's no organization for that matter that I 100% agree with. Not even close. I wouldn't hitch my back end to anything else in this world except for Jesus. Because I believe in him. I trust him. I agree with everything that I read. It's Jesus. You know, some people saw this, that we were going to do this series and got pretty excited. And like, I can't wait to show up because I've got it all figured out. I'm going to show up and Rich is going to blast the other party and tell them that they're wrong. I invited some friends so they could hear it for themselves, so they can understand what I've been, what I've been raising my fist for at work to support my political views. Well, that's not happening. I want to challenge us to think through, are, are we, are we will, when it comes to following Jesus, if you say, I'm a follower of Jesus, are you willing to put some space between you and the, your political party that you're standing for? Are you willing to put some space between you and the platform, the candidate that you're looking at? Are you willing to put some space? Are you willing to follow Jesus first and let him influence your decision and how you live and what you talk about and what you post? And Are you willing to put some distance between you? Are you willing to set all of that aside and start, first and be unified under Jesus. Now, let me be really clear. I'm not talking about some simple unification or some sense of utopia where we all hold hands, sing kumbaya and sway, right? You got to sway. If you're not swaying when you sing kumbaya, it's just not spiritual. There have been a lot of times in history where people were unified under an idea or a person that it didn't turn out so well. How about Nazi Germany in World War II? They're pretty unified. So when I'm talking about unified, I'm, it can be flawed. Our unity has to be under the only one who's ever lived a perfect life. And it's got to be Jesus. And because I read through these pages of this book, Jesus came to give life and life to the full, the best possible life. He said, I didn't come to condemn people. I came to save people. And make no mistake, friends. Right now, there is a fight for kingdoms taking place. One is fighting for an earthly kingdom. The other is fighting for an internal kingdom. And as a church, we have to decide which is most important to us. Let me just end verse 21 and give you a little bit of information where this may want to take you. It says, and to them, may, they may be one, Father, just you are in me and I'm in you. May they also be on us so that, so the world may believe that you have sent me. We are to be one so the world may believe that God sent Jesus. Our unity under Christ above all things is a testimony to the world that Jesus came to change everything. That Jesus is real. See, true unity, when it takes place in a church, is a cultural disruption. Because a culture doesn't want unity. 
when it looks in and sees people from every different facet of life or economic social ladder, when they're coming together, when it looks in and see people who absolutely disagree with certain things about what things are being done, and by the way, we're going to be talking about disagreeing next week, when they look in and see that, and we're all still moving in one direction with one message, one hope, under Christ, they think, oh my word, I don't like it. It frustrates them. Because everything in culture right now is to go on out to cause confusion. To keep us guessing so we don't know. So when the church is unified, it disrupts what the culture is trying to create and divide. When it comes to politics and unity, Ask yourself some simple questions. Do I want to make a point or do I want to make a difference? Is the person next to you more important than your political view? I think the answer is Jesus. He would say they are. We unified as one as a purpose. We have a purpose under Christ, testimony to the world of why Jesus came. Friends, only God has what this world needs. We need to remember that how we live, how we obey, how we respond is a direct reflection to the God that we love, serve, and proclaim to the world around us. That we, as the church, have more power than we realize. More influence than we realize. Power, not by pounding our fists and yelling and screaming, posting trash, not getting in heated debates, but simply in how we live and love people around us. Regardless of their view, power through the Spirit of Christ residing in the children of Christ that gives us strength and confidence and encouragement to live differently. Why? Because Jesus didn't come to take sides. Jesus came to take over. Jesus didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. The first century church missed this. When he was coming in, they're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. They want him to become king. He want, they want him to take over, push out the oppression. He is here. He's going to change everything. And he's like, you missed it. I didn't come over to take sides. I came to take over. And I think sometimes as a church that we might miss it. He didn't come to take over, take sides in the government. He didn't come to take sides in the educational systems. He didn't come to take sides in political parties. He didn't come to take sides in the media or even the Supreme Court, right? Jesus came to take over. To take over you, to take over me, one person at a time, one heart at a time, one soul at a time. Jesus' endgame is the world. And he says, <laughs> I want them to be one. So the world will see something different, giving the church every opportunity to reach people for Christ. <laughs> just before he steps into his prayer, just before he gets in and starts talking intimately to the Father, and I love the fact that we were able to listen to what he's talking to God the Father. But just before he takes place, he tells his disciples in, in John 16, verse 33, in this world you will have trouble. You will be dealing with some things that you never want to deal with. You'll be dealing with some hardships, some chaos and pain. But take heart. What? Jesus says, I have overcome the world. The world is his end game. That means the person in the other party is not your 
enemy. They are your opportunity. Opportunity to tell them of Jesus, express the love of Jesus. Our battles are not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities and the powers of the darkest world, the spiritual forces of evil. That's what we're fighting. The people are in front of us, that's our mission field. And we're one, moving in one direction, with one purpose, under Jesus. It tells them there's something different. Jesus has come to take over. Has he taken over you? Now, I... Has anyone ever been a part of the Oath of Allegiance ceremony for new citizens of the U.S.? I mean, not, maybe you not went through it. Maybe you went through it. Maybe you watched it, one in the back, that you've seen it take place. Have you ever read or heard the oath the new citizens of the United States of America actually say? I've never been a part of it. I've never read it before, before the studying for this conversation And when I read these words the other day, it absolutely overwhelmed me. We're going to read them. You can see them on the screen. You can go through them together. This is what they say. I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty to whom which I heretofore have been subject or citizen that I will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I'll be true fa- the, I will be, bear true faith and allegiance to the same. I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by law, that I'll perform non-combatant service in armed forces of the United States when required by law. I will perform work in national importance under civilian direction when required by law. And I will take this obligation freely. I will take it freely without any mental reservation or purpose or evasion. So help me God. That is an extremely powerful oath given by people who want to be U.S. citizens to be coming into our nation as citizens. I wonder if the the church, does God deserve any less devotion from us? Does God deserve any less commitment from his children? I mean, could we, could we stand and honestly say, I hereby declare an oath and absolutely entirely renounce and abjure allegiance and fidelity to the, to the Republican Party? Can we say the same thing for the, the Democratic Party? Can we say the same thing to the Libertarian Party, the Greenpeace Party, whatever kind of party you might be a title? Can, can we stand and say, listen, I'm going to renounce all that. And I'm a wholeheartedly and commit and surrender and give my life to God. Fully following him. Can we do that as a church? Can you do that as an individual? Now, if you're here this morning and you have not said yes to Jesus, you have never surrendered your life to Christ, it makes sense why you may fight for a political party and an earthly kingdom. It makes every sense. But I want to ask you today, are you willing to set all that aside to be part of Jesus' kingdom? One that lasts for eternity. Now, I'm not talking about Bridgewater kingdoms. We're not creating a cult here, you know. I'm talking about the kingdom of Christ. Surrendering our lives to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Having the humility to admit that, that, you know what, I'm a sinner. That I've lived my life without God. I've lived my life against God. That I'm understanding that I don't have what it takes to save myself. 
that I'm going to embrace the mercy and grace of God through Jesus Christ, that Jesus came and lived the perfect life, that he died on the cross for my sins, and he conquered death three days later. That you're willing to say today, I'm willing to lay down my life as he laid down his life for me. Making him the Lord of your life. And they, that, that may sound like an invasion. And it is. It's not a military invasion. It's an invasion of love. It's an invasion of truth and joy. And if you haven't, and you're ready, in this moment I'm going to pray. And you can pray with me. Give it all over to God. And start from ground zero. And start living as one with Christ. Those of us in this room, if you've ever given your life to Christ, do you realize that Jesus didn't come just to save you? That he came over to take over the world that means your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, your, and all those connected with you, your neighbors. He was praying that we would be unified for a purpose. That was his goal. Are you willing to maybe pick up those invite cards and invite someone to church that you know that does not have a relationship with Jesus? That are, that are missing out? Are you willing to invite them to be in your friends? Are you willing to overlook their political views because they are more important for you to step into the kingdom of Christ and having a, making a point in what you believe right now? You know, come November, someone's going to win, someone's going to lose. But I can tell you, honestly guarantee, in 100 years, 200 years, no one's going to care. But there is eternity in the balance. And we need to be one, one direction under one God, in Jesus. Let's pray. God, thanks for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you, the freedom that we have in, in this great nation to be under you. God, this is not an easy topic. As even as I prepared, I was frustrated by what's taking place in our nation what's taking place in your church and maybe what's taking place in my, even my own heart. So God, what a great reminder that we are first unified under Christ. That he is the difference maker. He is the savior. He changes the world. So I pray as a church, God, that we, as we walk this, through this, that we would stop and have an honest conversation with you, what's more important, our position or living for you? And God, that we be honest with ourselves and maybe make some heart changes that need to be made. God, there are people in this room right now who do not have a personal relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. And I want you to challenge them right now in their hearts. Don't let them be comfortable. Don't let the fear reside and to take control. God, work in them that today is the day they can change all things and make all things new with you. Give them the courage to step out in great faith. Not that they have to know everything, but they understand that they need Jesus. And if you're in this room and you have not done that yet in your life, just simply pray with me. It's not going to be in the words that we say, but it's going to be in your heart laying down your life for the one who laid down his life for you. And respond to me, Father, thank you for Jesus. 
I realize today that I need him in my life. I know that I'm a sinner, that I've lived without you. I've lived against you. And today, I want to turn that around. I believe in Jesus. I believe that he is your son. I believe he is the savior of the world. I believed he lived the perfect life, that he died on the cross for my sin, and that he conquered the grave. And today I want to turn away from my old life. I want to embrace a new life with you. You know, this morning, if you just prayed that with me, your life has been radically changed forever. And so with our eyes closed, church, and our heads bowed, would you, if you've prayed that, would you just raise your hand and show me? Lord, I understand that right now, what we're walking through as a nation, as a community, didn't catch you by surprise. The end game is not a party or position or person. Well, it is a person. It's the person of Jesus Christ. I pray as we walk through this that we can be a light for you in an ever-increasing, growing, dark world. May we be a church that freely proclaims that Jesus changes everything. It's in his name we pray. Amen.